Hello and welcome one and all. My name is Sophie Kamarudin. I'm a reporter at Bloober Television in Hong Kong and it is my absolute pleasure to be moderating this session entitled The Future of Finance, Leveraging Digitization for a Virtual World. Now, even before the pandemic struck earlier this year, financial services players had already been managing a host of challenges to achieving their goals when it comes to success in their digitization efforts, be it regulators ramping up their scrutiny, the demands for more robust data infrastructure, which is increasingly pressing, and there is more and more competition from both startups and tech giants alike. And that competition is very fierce here in Asia, where the likes of WeChat and Ant Financial have captured consumer attention away from some of the more traditional players. So against that backdrop, what we aim to focus on with this roundtable discussion is to learn how organizations are tapping technology such as AI and the cloud to update systems and achieve their goals, not to mention protect privacy against cybersecurity threats and most importantly, in a post-COVID world, what will be the biggest pitfalls to avoid? And joining us for this session are folks on the front lines of the financial services industry. And we want to hear from each and every one of you on the strategies and changes that you are undertaking to stay competitive as well as to stay innovative in a future that has been drastically altered by the pandemic. But before we kick off the conversation, just a few housekeeping tips to keep this conversation flowing. Since this is a virtual event, if there are any uh, disruptions to your connection, uh, please refresh your browser and ensure that you are using <coughs> Firefox or Chrome. And if Zoom does crash or you get disconnected, just refresh the browser and log back in. And if you could take this time now just to close any other applications or programs you ha may have running in the background, that will help things run very smoothly. And again, keeping this discussion conversational is the aim of the game. So if any time someone would like to chime in, there is the raise hand function within Zoom that will help me see that you are wanting to jump into the conversation. So please make sure to uh, click unmute uh, if you are chiming in. And when you're not speaking, please press the mute button so that we can keep the conversation flowing. And again, this is interactive, this is conversational, so let's keep this chat going forward. And of course, this is a networking opportunity, so anytime, jump into the chat so you can have a dialogue with your peers on the side as well. And at this juncture, I want to thank our sponsor, IBM, for helping make this virtual roundtable possible. And with that, I'd like to invite Likit Wargle, General Manager of Global Banking and Financial Markets, to say a few words. Sophie, uh, thank you very much indeed, and uh, thank you to the esteemed members of uh, today's panel. I'm uh, deeply honored to be a part of this and very, very much uh, looking forward uh, to this uh, discussion. Uh, I think in, in introduction, I really wanted to uh, maybe highlight uh, two, or three, uh, two or three things. Uh, I think the first piece, and, and I think you highlighted it, Sophie, when you talked about competition, uh, I think the competition has been very, very fierce uh, in the Asia Pacific region. I used to be based out of Singapore uh, before moving to New York a little bit earlier uh, this year. And it, it's really been striking for me as to how much ahead uh, you know, the banks are in the Asia Pacific region, driven mainly as a result of the competition that they're facing from big tech or were facing from big tech. I think what COVID is going to do, uh, to my mind, is, is essentially three main things. And, and I very much uh, look forward to the opinions of uh, the folks that are on the panel today. Uh, I, think, I think the first piece is very much around uh, a real acceleration in the pace of the digitization of banks and banks becoming uh, digital businesses. Uh, I think we're going to be facing an extremely challenging uh, environment, whilst the growth in uh, the Asia-Pac region is probably going to be a little bit higher than what we're going to see in the US and Europe. It's certainly going to be substantially lower than where it was before. And if you look at where net interest margins will be and also what's going to happen to back debts, you know, we're looking at a real challenge on returns on, on, of, of equity, which are likely to be somewhere between four to five percentage points uh, below where they were before. What the pandemic has also done is made uh, customers very much more demanding. They are looking for banking anywhere, uh, anytime. They've got used to that sort of experience uh, you know, in the kind of COVID environment, and they're going to look for that sort of experience going forward. What's furthermore to be said about experience is they're getting extremely used to 
uh, big tech and the way in which big tech services their demands. So they're going to look for frictionless experience. They're looking for instant fulfillment and they're looking for a radically reduced cost to serve, right? So I think uh, an acceleration on digitization to meet those customer demands, to meet the threats from big tech uh, is going to continue to be very, very important in the kind of post um, uh, COVID environment, especially in the in the uh, kind of Asia Pac uh, region. I think the second piece that I would call out, um, and this is coming out again and again, particularly when I meet with my clients in the US and also in, in Europe, which is the regulators are not providing any latitude to the banks at all as far as operationally operational resiliency is concerned, right? In the current circumstances, they do not want any of the banks to go down or to have outages and therefore, they're paying particular heat to make sure that the banks are dealing with issues around resiliency, uh, around cybercrime, around fraud. So this is going to be an area where I don't think banks are going to have any opportunity to postpone the expenditures that they need to that they need to incur. I think the regulators are going to be very strict in terms of what is going to happen. And then I think third, the third piece is if you look at the structure of the industry going forward, I mean, to my mind, what's becoming quite clear is that the fintechs are not a threat to the industry. I think the banks have learned that fintechs are who you collaborate with. The fintechs are becoming an engine for innovation for banking, just in the same way as biotechnology companies were engines for innovation for the pharmaceutical industry. Exactly the same thing is happening here. And I think, therefore, the more banks can develop platforms that deal with ecosystems that can actually plug into those fintechs, the more successful they're likely to be going forward. Because ultimately, what your customers are, are, are wanting is for you to solve their core needs. They're not wanting you to be providing purely uh, financial services products. And, and, and therefore, in terms of the future of finance, I think those banks that remain uh, you know, restricted in the scope of what they're doing exclusively to financial services products, I think will find at best that you will become a commodity player with people coming to you only if you are offering the cheapest price to them. Or at worst, what you're going to find is you see a Kodak moment where vast chunks of your business uh, just, just disappear. A sobering thought to complete, Sophie, before I hand, hand back to you. You know, even in the US where you do not have the likes of Ant Financial or uh, the likes of WeChat playing the sorts of roles that they've been doing you know, as disruptors in, in Asia Pacific, you still have the second largest financial services institution in the US is actually PayPal, right? PayPal is much bigger than any of the other banks with the exception of JP Morgan Chase. So I don't think this is anything other than a global phenomenon and, and really a potentially a, a big wake up call for the, for the banks. So, so Sophie, that's a kind of some, some um, a flavor for what hopefully we'll talk about through this discussion. Now, look at thank you. A lot to unpack there with your opening remarks. As you say, this is a wake up moment. It has been a series of wake up moments as there has been generational shifts in how consumers uh, want their services to be delivered. And with that, let's set the tone of the conversation to check in where each of the institutions are at when it comes to their digital transformation. And that will allow us to understand where you want to go into the future. Uh, I'd like to kick off with some thoughts on the top digital transformation priority for each of the players on this uh, discussion. What was it before the pandemic and how has that changed when you look into that post pandemic world? Uh, William uh, from Hong Leong Bank, uh, you've been tracking the journey of what a changing consumer mindset will require when the consumer wants uh, things that are uh, providing choice that's fast, it can, that can be delivered anywhere, anytime that is consistent and free, what is your priority when it comes to digital transformation going forward and how is it different from what it was before? Yeah, thanks. So you're, I think, um, Lekit, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Lekit um, said it correctly. I don't think it's the fintechs, et cetera, that are driving us. It's really the customer expectations. So to fight with the big tech guys or to make sure that we maintain the market share we go we have to um enable exactly what you've just said it's got to be anywhere anytime fast and basically convenient we have been running that journey now for three to four years so before the pandemic we were quite well equipped to deal with it i think where we're probably changing now is to look more at the digital authentication so i think this is one of the challenges that a lot of people are going to face in the coming years is how do we do um, authentication and how do we qualify people 
So that's really where our focus is going to be. So I agree. Um, we will definitely be looking at a lot of machine learning. We're going to be looking at a lot of use of data, um, both structured and unstructured. Not just our data, but also data from outside the banks um, to be able to converge it, to be able to identify our customers and, as you say, um, identify the fraud factors, et cetera, that come with it. So this is really going to be our focus um, probably for the next two to three years um, to keep in line. When the big tech guys do uh, come in, they obviously they can't uh, really sell anything we can't. The advantage that they have is the data. So the banking industry for the longest time, in my personal opinion, has been predominantly focused on performing the transaction and not what the transaction was for. So that's where we are going to start making a change. Uh, change is of the essence, especially for the players that have been in the game for many years, hundreds of years, for some in the room. BPI, one of the oldest banks in the Philippines, for example, and Noel, under uh, your leadership, we've seen the digital customer base grow by leaps and bounds. I believe the number is at 4 million right now. So with that baseline going forward, what is your top priority when it comes to digital transformation? Uh, I think you're on mute, Noel. If you could just please uh, unmute yourself. Uh, the, the customer base right now is actually four and a half million. Uh, we've been growing uh, on a weekly basis, leaps and bounds. Um, what, what we're doing is we're taking advantage of uh, BPI being one of the largest uh, bank in the country, having a strong corporate uh, relationship presence and retail franchise. Uh, what we're doing is we're aggregating the value that we can create out of this relationship, including extending this to our partners. So what we have done is uh, in the last four years is we created an environment, an API-based uh, infrastructure that allows us to easily connect partners, customers, both retail and corporate. So our priority is um, having this connection, having the data traffic passing through, through these connections. Our priority would be to include machine learning and um, artificial intelligence to create those uh, customer exp experience, the value added customer experience that we can create out of this information. On the topic of APIs, that's something that the Bank of Baroda uh, has been uh, trying to expand when it comes to your ecosystem, uh, kill partnerships through API so that the bank doesn't have to build everything from scratch and then scale vertically. Uh, so with that in mind, what is your biggest priority? Right. No, I, I think uh, just building on what Likit said in his opening comments, uh, it's very important to have platforms that plug into ecosystems. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, while we're a large bank, um, 130 million customers, uh, but the fact remains that you know we can't do everything, and we can't be everywhere, and uh, which is why it is very important to tap into these emerging ecosystems and the islands that are there, and connect into them effectively. Uh, so we have a fairly robust API strategy uh, as we speak. Uh, of course, you know it's a work in progress in terms of being able to connect and deliver a superior customer experience um, because ultimately the customers are now getting more and more engaged uh, at platforms which are outside the bank's platforms uh, for us to remain relevant uh, and deliver just in time banking services um, it's very important that we get in there so that's what we're doing uh, with the ecosystem partnerships we have a range of them from across our lobs um, from retail, uh, the small medium businesses, uh, for payments, uh, we have a, a very robust agri platform as well that we have launched for our agri customers, and that is an advisory and transaction platform, uh, which brings together a lot of ecosystem partners onto that platform. So, some very exciting work that is that is underway um, at the Bank of Baroda. Uh, you oversee the uh, Bangkok Bank's innovation hub, the Eno Hub, and that would require building out an ecosystem as well. So what are the pieces you're putting into play to pursue uh, your digital transformation priority? Good morning, Sophie. Uh, first of all, we have to understand 
um, why all of us cannot afford uh, not to do the digital transformation. There are three main reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, our customer, uh, whether we are the service uh, 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 company like uh, bank, financial institution, or uh, any corporate uh, selling goods or uh, restaurant selling meals, uh, what we have to understand is the channel which they access to our product or services has already changed. And uh, now they, they're moving to mobile, uh, as everyone know. Now, secondly, the, the suppliers of goods that uh, uh, construct uh, your service or products, uh, whether you, you're buying uh, through the supply chain or some of the application that the bank will have to to uh, make into uh, the new uh, services. Uh, all of the supply chain, everything, all the workflow, especially in acquiring uh, those supplies has all already turned to digital. And thirdly, the workflow internally within your bank, the way that you're doing things, all the process that you're doing uh, has already uh, been uh, digi digitalized uh, by others uh, if, if you're not doing. So if you link all the workflow together in providing a product or service to a client, it could be at least uh, uh, easily two dozen uh, pieces in the workflow. Now, if you look at, at each one from the, the customer side, from the supplier side, and through the bank itself, uh, you find out that the the old way of doing things are now gone. Uh, all these, uh, there are, if, if there are two a dozen pieces of workflow that there are a new way of doing things. Uh, if your competitor or a new entrant such as FinTech sees it and they seize it and they change it, what are you gonna do? Uh, your, your competitive advantage disappeared. So uh, in, in every service that you provide, there may, you may need to change 24 different things. Now, a bank our size, which has been uh, doing this process for a long time, if we need to change, that will take uh, quite a few projects. But let's say if you have 24 uh, different uh, fintechs uh, hitting you at the same time, that's where they can become uh, make an inroad into your service. Now, if we don't do it, and if your competitor does, where does it leave you? So you have to understand that the, uh, there are major changes uh, in, in everywhere that it used to be physical, physical, and physical, and now everything starts with digital and ends with it digital. So the old way of banking that's over with, the new way of thinking, is required to take advantage of uh, the type of power you have in terms of the data uh, at your fingertips. And this reminds me of something that uh, we were talking about leaking before about the needs to transform the whole vertical stack to ensure your workflows and your efficiencies really deliver for the consumer. Um, I wanna bring Lito into the conversation right now. You're considered the Mr. FinTech in the Philippines. You're the chairman of the FinTech Alliance. So you've been in this game for some time. Uh, so with Rizal Commercial Banking Corporation, uh, what type of priorities are being established to ensure that you're ahead of the game? Well, this uh, pandemic uh, practically provided us with a you know, with a wider perspective. Uh, in fact, COVID-19 is undoubtedly the greatest disruptor um, of all time. And uh, practically it's not fintechs or other uh, emerging technologies uh, that would practically disrupt the business. But it's really more, I think, 2021 would be an era of massive competition. Because in the Philippines, for example, the regulatory landscape has been very uh, dynamic when it comes to uh, enabling 
players in the industry to further accelerate digitalization. In fact, uh, in our case for RCBC, a uh, good thing that we were able to invest um, heavily on digital transformation way ahead of the pandemic. So that's why we now experience even up to four digit exponential growth when it comes to digital transactions. So at the end of the day, the uh, ultimate metric would be more on having a consumer adoption. And in fact, with that, we were able to also launch uh, in the midst or in the middle of the pandemic, a new mobile app, uh, which we call this Cartech, which is a, uh, the first and only taglish inclusion super app in the Philippines. Um, and we were delighted uh, because our fears before was that how can you even launch uh, you know, a mobile product in the middle of the hard lockdown? Uh, well, in fact, all the people I mean, the public uh, is more engaged when it comes to the concerns to their health uh, and safety, etc., because of restricted mobility uh, and, of course, the health care. So we were so delighted that uh, you know, after one month from the launch, we hit over a million mobile app downloads. And now we have over 3 million app downloads since uh, from the launch in, in July. So the thing here is that uh, I think the, the name of the game really is on how you could really deliver a unique value proposition and, a, you know, uh, and also how you can provide uh, you know, awesome customer experience. Because in the Philippine perspective right now, uh, what we are now seeing is really the adoption of what we call open banking, which is actually good for uh, our regulator because now we have uh, the draft guidelines on open finance framework, which would now allow players to really embrace uh, the EU crafted or EU developed PSD2 on open banking. So again, as I've said, it's really more on competition on how we can bring all players together with the consumers as the ultimate players. And with us, we have uh, Richard Lung, a group CTO at the Hong Kong Exchange, one of those players that will enable a dynamic landscape for the financial services industry. There's been a multi-pronged strategy to ensure that Hong Kong uh, maintains its edge as a financial hub, uh, given the rising competition elsewhere. Uh, so Richard, looking forward at the roadmap ahead, what kind of role does the Hong Kong Exchange play in providing this dynamism? Thank you, Sufi. Um, well, as you have said, uh, technology empowered is one of the uh, is one of the core uh, pillar of HAEX uh, three year strategic plan. We we embrace uh, innovation and technology to maintain our leadership role in shaping the global capital markets. Our long term commitment uh, to using technology uh, to enhance the market infrastructure has not changed. Uh, say, for example. Uh, if people understand uh, our market infrastructure, the core of it, which is the trading and the post-trade infrastructure, they have been digitized for many years. It's fully automated because that's the only way we can handle, um, you know, millions of transactions uh, 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 every, every second. So that has, has been digitized. Uh, at HEEX, we focus on using innovation and technology to look at uh, improving the interaction between the participants of our market and our central system. For example, in the, in the last few weeks, we have announced uh, two very major projects which help us to enhance uh, the overall uh, market infrastructure uh, in Hong Kong. The first one being uh, for Project Fini, which is quite a revolutionized uh, project that we will significantly shorten the IPO cycle in Hong Kong from five days to uh, T plus one, which is a very significant improvement to our, our market uh, here in Hong Kong. The second one of it, which is what we call the project synapse. And that project, again, we're using innovative uh, technology. We have chosen to use uh, smart contracts to actually help the share uh, 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 allocation of all our northbound stock connect trade, which has been very, very active in 2020. And with this enhanced um, processes, we think we can bring more vibrance to the financial market uh, in Hong Kong. And with the vibrancy, you need talent to really allow for that to happen. Uh, Sanjoy, at the Bank of Singapore, several data scientists have been brought on board uh, to give an emphasis on data. 
going forward. So what are your plans uh, in the years following uh, to beef up uh, your approach to capturing uh, the potential of data? Thank you, Sophie, and, and thank you, Ligit. It's great to be on, on such a distinguished panel. And, you know, a number of the themes that I've heard brought up for, through, through my colleagues, client experience, frictionless, ecosystem, the regulatory environment, are very, very much themes that we're discussing at, at Bank of Singapore at, at the moment as well. I think, though, you know, the banks have been investing heavily in technology over the last few years, probably not fast enough, given the challenges we now face. But, but one thing that's important for us to remember is it's, it's easy to get caught up in the exuberance of technology, but forgetting what is the business outcome that we're trying to achieve. And that comes to, when it comes to data, whether it comes to AI or any, any of the new and emerging technologies. So we have to look back firstly at customer experience. I think what COVID has done, it hasn't changed our digital plans. It somewhat accelerated our digital plans or our digital transformation. If I look back at the last few months, you know, we've moved from 50% digital adoption in January to 75% digital adoption in, in July. So clients are becoming more digitally demanding. Our colleagues are becoming more digitally demanding as well. When it comes to customer experience, we've moved to much more paperless processes, removed the, um, the need for wet signatures, et cetera. So to your, to your point on data, I think it's, it's not data for data's sake, but understanding what we're going to use the data for. And that then take, takes you through thinking what is the three year, five year horizon in terms of private banking. And I, I think I heard someone say digital, digital, digital. I think we have to be cautious because in private banking, for example, the human is very, very much part of the relationship. And in the high net worth and ultra high net worth space that we operate in, the trusted advisor element is, is very, very important to the customer journey. So I think what we need to think about is how we enable our colleagues and our clients to have access to data and digital experiences, but not forgetting that the relationship manager remains pivotal to the relationship as well. Now, William, I saw you shaking your head, uh, nodding your head rather, uh, as Sanjoy was speaking there. Would you care to chime in? Yes, no, he's um, expressed it quite well because aggregating the data and collecting the data is one thing, but. I believe you have to be careful you don't end up in a trap of just gathering data to gather data. You really need to be able to have like an end outcome for it or you just end up with literally a mass of data and it gets very confusing. So that's where I was in agreement with you. Also to, to the point, um, I don't think, this is my personal view, I don't think COVID has accelerated um, financial institutions, digital ambitions i think it's been there for a long time i think what it has changed it's changed the consumer's adoption mm. so the adoption is being taken up at a far greater rate than it used to be so that was the other thing that i i would concur um i don't think it has changed um the way that we look at it we need to put banking in everyone's hands it, it needs to be there we need to be very customer centric and we need to make sure that we're using the data to enable the customers better, so they make better choices, the better insights in, into their um, financial freedoms, etc. So, as consumers I, I agree with you. I think the the it's a good point. I think what it has done is reinforce some of our narratives from a client perspective. Clients mm. now, as we've said before, are used to frictionless experiences, whether it's on Netflix or on Uber, etc. So, client self serve abilities have become very vanilla. We need to offer our clients the ability to do things themselves. I think the second um, part that has been driven by clients and in, in, in my head, the narrative that we, we need to focus on is personalized and contextualized content. Clients now expect a lot more of that, uh, especially from, a, from in private banking, show me data or content that's relevant to me from a customer experience standpoint. So when we speak about data and the gathering of data, that data has to be used with that in mind as well that the client is seeing things that is relevant to them at that particular time. So I agree with what you've said. Yeah. And, and I think uh, Sanjay, just to um, add to that, right? I think, I think because both you and uh, William have made some, uh, you know, really, really good points around, uh, around uh, customer experience and around uh, contextual banking. And, and I think that aspect of it is the piece that's really important, right? Because when you look at it fundamentally, uh, you know, consumers are not, using uh, banking in it, you know, for itself, right? They, they use banking services as an enabler to do something else. 
And I think it's that's that's the piece that the tech companies have worked out very well, right? Which is they are solving that core problem and then providing the financial services enabler that's required in order to uh, address that particular problem uh, in a very similar sort of way, right? So, so I think the banks need to do that uh, as well. And I think Sanjay, the expression you used, contextual banking, that's very much how you know we are thinking about it within the context of a lot of a lot of the clients that we are actually working with at this moment in time, right? Which is what is the context? What is the core problem? That the client is uh, seeking to solve. How do you use an ecosystem to be able to provide, you know, the solution to the entire need? And then the financial services aspect of it, whether that's, uh, you know, making an investment or making a payment, needs to be something that's seamlessly embedded in the solution of that particular issue. Right. Completely agree. Uh, yeah. yeah. Our our observation here is uh, from the from the mantra of uh, many years ago, we call omni-channel, right? We're now moving into a, a, a convergence channel era, right? Um, it's no longer saying that um, it's a continuous experience from one channel to another. We're now seeing a convergence wherein we actually coined the word for this called digital, wherein delivering a physical-like interaction, but digitally. Without without losing that that human touch, but uh, still uh, be able to capitalize on the digital tools that is available. Um, if I may say, the zoomification of financial services is is going to happen, or it's currently happening right now. We we're, we're conducting a lot of our webinars, uh, conducting a lot of advisory services remotely but without losing that, uh, that human touch, right? Because actually delivering this digitally, uh, we are seeing it may even be superior to the face-to-face -face because right now you can still see, you can still see your advisor. You can walk through uh, the presentation, the advisory um, uh, pitch that you're giving and still being recorded. So even the regulatory compliance is stronger, right? It's, it's recorded. Um, you can play it back. You can see that uh, what presentation was used. So there's the, the, the ability for dispute and so on is, is stronger now, right? Mm -hmm. So the convergence in physical and digital delivered uh, all at the same time is what we expect to to happen in the next couple of years. So okay, with sorry, the... just yeah, sorry, just to react okay. to that uh, point by uh, William a while ago. I mean, um, in terms when we talk about um, you know the the COVID nineteen as the ultimate disruptor, is in fact it's just a stimulus by which the all actors practically in any in any industry across industry or uh, segments or sectors. Uh, we're practically caught off guard, right? So it's really more of a supply and demand thing, wherein while it is really true that the primary or the core would definitely be more of having the consumer, you know, it's really dictated by consumer um, expectations, right? Because at the end of the day, there's no, right now, uh, there is a very thin line of having loyal customers to practically them enjoying the, the most convenient customer experience right, being provided by any other player. So I think it's really more on how traditional players in the industry would now be able to adapt to the demands of the consumers in so far as having to provide uh, you know, um, uh, the best service ever, right? Because consumers, in the perspective of consumers, it doesn't matter whether, for example, it is provided by a fintech or by a traditional bank, etc. For as long as they are being provided with the same banking experience, with the same service that they want, uh, would really the, the the thing that would really matter. So I, again, from years back, that Bill Gates said that you know banking is essential and banks are not, is practically happening right now. Right. So it's not really banking industry that's being disrupted, but practically all all industries as well. It's more of how you net uh, how you make sure that the banking experience would be similar to any other digital. Uh, services that uh, consumers are enjoying right now, like having to watch Netflix or having to subscribe to other digital platforms. Akhil, may add to the sorry, uh, Sophie. May add on the COVID uh, 
I, I think it has uh, accelerated, uh, especially uh, while we are locked down, uh, we've used a lot of service such as the ordering food uh, through Line Man in, in Thailand. Um, that start to show that uh, the banking uh, business happened to be at the back end of uh, any uh, customer journey. For example, if, if they want uh, a meal, instead of uh, in the past, we, we, go, we go on a car, travel to a restaurant, enjoy it, and then the last transaction is we pay, right? Uh, if, if you want to go and buy goods uh, in the uh, department store, you travel, you go and pick uh, up uh, your browse through the store, and then at the end, you pay. So the banking is the last transaction in everything. But now, when the customer wants to uh, have uh, a good meal, they order through their mobile phone, through Line Man, and it deliver to you. So where's the banking? You have to pay. Now, if your, your bank is not at the back end of that application, you're not there. Uh, same thing is uh, when you buy goods, right? Now, now you go through the, the e-commerce site, et cetera, and the payment is always the last transaction. So we have to be aware that uh, all the customer journey now is, is more and more through digital channel by someone else. And uh, the traditional, so you go and check, uh, every day there are uh, more uh, application coming on. So the bank is very important to make sure that we always be at the back end uh, linking somehow to them. Uh, I, can't I just want to add, uh, yeah, I, so I just wanted to add uh, again, you know, this ecosystems, uh, the whole play is extremely important. And, um, you know, I wanted to uh, give an example from India. Uh, we have uh, a payment system that was a, a big innovation in India in the year 2016. And that is called as UPI. And over the last four years, this has become 50% of the market. We do almost 2 billion transactions in a month through UPI. And you know, this is a country of about uh, a billion people. And this is expected to go to a billion a day. Right? And the biggest, uh, the biggest revelation here is 90% of these transactions are actually not happening through banks platforms. They're happening through non-bank platforms. And these are platforms like Google, Amazon, etc. And this is what digital, going digital actually enables because customers do not really have to engage with the banking platform per se. You know, they can, they can originate their journeys uh, at whatever platforms they are, you know, and it just becomes and weaves into their lifestyle and their purchases and the journeys that they're doing on the other platforms. Um, and, you know, just like payments, now I see a big shift happening in the lending space as well in India. So this is a huge uh, uh, effort that we are also putting in, in terms of enabling digital lending. Because ultimately, I, I think as one of the panelists said, uh, you know, banks really have to now start becoming infrastructure providers more than anything else. I think we can be relevant to a certain part, uh, but we cannot be relevant to everything. And again, you know, of course, it's, it's off quoted uh, you know, the, uh, the Bill Gates uh, in which is banks, uh, banking is necessary, banks are not. I wouldn't go as far as that, but I would say that look, banks are necessary, but you know, banks need not be there in every journey. And I think that is what is precisely happening. And COVID has just accelerated this journey by about five years. So all we discuss now is, you know, digital has to be the left and center. And, you know, while earlier, you know, omni channel used to be a great word and, you know, we used to have this uh, branch and, 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 and digital channels kind of a strategy. I think the focus now is purely digital. Sometimes probably at the, uh, you know, at, at the expense of our offline channels as well, because that is what is now sharply in focus. Yeah. Yeah. If I, if I may add, uh, being a, uh, well, infrastructure operator. I think one of our really key goals in our, in our mission is to provide a fair, orderly, and transparent market. Um, different from banks, uh, we have very different. Uh, uh, we have a very wide mix of uh, users of our infrastructure. 
on one hand, we have very sophisticated uh, institutional investors. On the other extreme, we have a lot of you know, personal investors who might not be um, uh, 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 very well worth, uh, uh, well averse with the uh, technology capabilities. So I, I think our digital um, journey, the challenge to our digital journey is not so much internal, but external. You know, how can we convince, uh, you know, the regulator that we can do something for the good of the entire market? And what is entire market? If we do something that can only benefit or can only be adopted by the major player, then we probably are not doing our job. So um, our strategy has always been that we will work with you know, other you know, service provider who can help this, um, you know, sm smaller investors in this journey of, of digitiza uh, digitization. So I, I really would see it as a effort of a, commun a community rather than solely you know, the uh, function of a uh, market infrastructure operator to provide all this uh, advancement in uh, digitization. Sophie, uh, one, one of the one of the things that will probably be, uh, you know, really interesting to hear from the panel, right? Because I think we've talked about um, uh, the digitization and that very much being the universal priority. I think everybody's agreed that that's the case. I think there's some really good uh, points being made about data and the importance of of, of data and machine learning. Um, you know, Akil's talked about ecosystems and and uh, you know the um, you know just now on the kind of getting the smaller players involved, I think is important as well. I, I'd like to hear a little bit about what um, the members of the panel are doing in terms of their architectures, right? Particularly mm -hmm. around their applications and infrastructure, because, um, you know, one of the key challenges to banks genuinely becoming digital businesses and delivering the type of experience we were talking about is the fact that, you know, they're stuck on uh, legacy architectures uh, that they cannot move workloads onto the public cloud and therefore they do not have the kind of flexibility and agility that you would need if you really want to be the Netflix of the banking industry, right? Yeah, absolutely. What? So with, especially with the way consumers are leaning more towards applications uh, that are in the cloud or towards AI, so infrastructure, how do you upgrade that? Sophie, I just would like to uh, hear. Yeah, for, uh, for, for us, I mean, for RCBC, we've been, uh, we have embraced open banking and that is to the point uh, made earlier, uh, open infrastructure, open APIs would really be the, you know, the name of the game right now, right? So it's more of how you can come up with, uh, you know, the emerging business model right now, which is uh, uh, banking as a service or pay, we call it pay as you grow. Uh, um, initiative, right? So it's, I think, more than ever, uh, they, you are right that uh, we really have to embrace, or we have embraced open banking or open API architecture as uh, as a mindset and as as a as a policy. But where does this put new programs? Where does this put your investment uh, in the, the years to come, so that you keep up with the demands that are required of a more robust infrastructure? Yes, definitely. Uh, that's why you cannot really just be the one doing all these things because, again, you cannot do it alone, right? You have all the partners around you uh, to really uh, uh, have a robust and sustainable ecosystem built. So that is why uh, that, that mindset and that policy of having an open API has to be there. And, okay, put, it's really putting your money where your mouth is in terms of putting in the right investment to really run it. Yeah, and we heard about some... Uh customer adoption when it comes to digital, 70%, uh, somebody mentioned earlier. I imagine that can only grow. Uh, Sanjoy, uh, you know, how do you keep up with that pace when it comes to investments in the right place? So I, I think you're on mute. Can everyone hear Sanjoy? It's, I think it might be his microphone. Okay. All right. Let's try that again. Can you hear me now? Yes, much better. Thank you. Okay. So I would again go back to, we, we talked about architecture, right? And what's the right architecture and investment in our, on architecture? Should we go to cloud, not cloud, et cetera? I think it goes back to, again, what are we trying to achieve? And then who are the partners we need to work with to achieve that? So let's talk about, let's say it's content management, okay? Who are the people that we need to work with in terms of the content management architecture? Who are the players there? Do we build it inside? Do we, do we partner with someone from the outside? How do we leverage FemTech? 
then we need to think about, okay, how do we work with the regulators? Okay, because the regulators, I, for me, are a partner in this journey for financial institutions as well. And we've had very good conversations as we've pivoted this year with MAS and HKMA on moving many of our processes, and they've been very supportive on that. So when we think about, okay, where do we need to invest? It has to be based on what the client is looking for from us. So I think institutions have to have a digital narrative. They have to have a strategic story to say, this is what the way, this is how the customer landscape is changing. And therefore this is going to determine our sequence of, of investment. And it's not just, I think, from a client perspective, we also need to think from an employee or colleague perspective. If we are to attract the best colleagues and the best you know, employees to an institution, we have to make life easy for them within the institution itself. So when we invest, we need to not only look from a client perspective, but also internally as well. And that's how I think we should think of our narratives as financial institutions. But I really see the regulators as partners in this journey, rather than someone we need to convince. I think we have to show them from a client perspective how it's beneficial for them while keeping obviously, as, as mentioned previously, all the risk and control um, 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 touch points in place. Akhil? Yeah, from, I from to um, make a point on uh, the architecture and uh, see the kind of digitization that we're seeing and the volumes that we are now noticing, which are absolutely to the roof. Um, the cores of the banks were never designed for this high throughput. So what we're seeing right now is very high volume, low, uh, low ticket size transactions. And the cores are absolutely not geared for such kind of volumes. Even if we do it today, two years down the line, uh, this is going to be a big bottleneck. So absolutely there has to be innovation now that has to be done at the core. Uh, part of the response is, of course, to move certain workloads to the cloud, and you know there are other responses uh, in terms of you know digitizing and having you know some sort of an, uh, a sub model, uh, a wallet kind of a model that can be built in. Uh, but that is absolutely necessary, and I think the work um, that we're doing with some of our partners and and and, and the tech giants uh, is very important to ensure that we can deliver. Um, a consistent customer experience. Yeah, uh, what we have done is uh, first we we look at the business architecture. You know? We 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 decompose the the whole process from the product manufacturing all the way to the distribution, and then from there we we segregate it. What are the value added services that we can put around it, and then we componentize this, and then understand which one can go to the cloud, which one can go, go to the, the business partners and therefore deliver the, this uh, as a complete customer experience. So we didn't just look at the technology. What we did is the whole framework of what is the business architecture that will allow us to deliver this and what are the key components and who are the players that would allow us to partner with to deliver this uh, to the end consumer. So this is the kind of um, readiness that we have put in in the last couple of years. And I believe would allow us to, to be competitive in the next, uh, in the future of uh, finance. Yeah. Uh, and again, uh, Noel, I think, I think that's a point really very, very well made, right? Particularly the way in which you describe the components and you know, where those components need to go to, right? I think the challenge that I would place for this uh, particular panel, and, and I'm not sure we're going to have the time to debate this, Sophie, but the challenge to think about would be, you know, today at best, I would assert, uh, you know, a banking business is able to put probably about 20% of its workloads onto the public cloud, right? I think if the bank is going to truly um, deliver that type of customer experience at the cost points that we've discussed on this call, you know, my hypothesis would be that we need to get probably about 50 to 60% of workloads onto the public cloud. This is why, you know, um, at IBM together with Bank of America and BNPP, you know, we, we're working very closely to create a secure public cloud, right? Which enables uh, banks to put those mission critical workloads onto the public cloud in an environment that meets the regulatory requirements and also the data privacy requirements, right? And I think, uh, again, you know, my assertion would be if we, if we were having this conversation, even maybe in 12 months time, uh, I would suspect that, you know, each one of you would have made uh, a lot of progress down that particular path, right? Because it's going to be essential to support 
that have a digital programs you are you know you you're you're driving so effectively otherwise right yeah i, I think so, um, you know, my 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 view about the cloud journey is not necessarily you know measured by percentage of workload that you you put on the cloud i think fit per purpose is a uh, is an even more important uh, considerations um, I agree that uh, you know the uh, regulator is our partner in this journey, um, but we have to show them the, the show to the regulator that we understand the risk. We have all the mitigation uh, 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 available before we embark on this cloud journey. You know, at HAEX, um, we are rather conservative in our cloud journey, but that doesn't, it doesn't mean that we don't uh, have a way to move onto cloud. For something that are core mission critical to us, that affect the market stability, we still put it on our own infrastructure. We are we are we are uh, 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 lucky enough to have a very good uh, data center, uh, tier four data center for ourselves, and we can always host those um, uh, 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 workload there. However, there are certain workload which I would call them fit for purpose on the cloud that we will have no hesitation as long as it fits the security profile and the security considerations that we have, we put on the cloud. For example, anything that require a huge amount of storage, there is a, a very easy use case to put it on the cloud. If your workload has a very um, uh, dynamic uh, usage pattern, that is also something that is very suitable for the cloud. So, you know, my view is that, you know, I, I don't go for a certain percentage, I go for, you know, what kind of fit for purpose applications do we have to put on a cloud? Well, oh. for, for our bank on the architecture side, uh, we have to design architecture to help the core bank today uh, because of the massive transaction coming in. So basically we separate the layer uh, of the customer touch point layer and the partner uh, layers away from the core bank. Uh, so in the middle, we have to reuse a lot of the, the service, uh, such as uh, using the, the, the IBM traditional middleware and the, uh, but now we add the API layer, but also to help the core bank, we have to use the operational data store in order to help um, on, uh, because now you need a lot of data uh, from your partner and, and your customer uh, coming check checking through your balance, et cetera, or doing the liquidity management. And uh, so you have to shield that from the core bank. So operational data store is some of the things that we also invest in. And this might be, yeah. Sorry. William, please? No, please. No, it would be very similar. I agree entirely. It really depends on the workload that you want to put onto the cloud. Um, I don't think everything necessarily needs to go to the cloud. Hardware for all intents and purposes is a commodity. So if you put it on the cloud or it's on-prem, as long as it's the right price point for what you're doing, then that, that is what's gonna happen, I personally think. So I agree. Um, from a development perspective uh, for um, customer differentiation and products that we build, um, I believe we have to build it ourselves and that's what's gonna give us the edge. Um, over the big tech guys, et cetera, because that's, as I was saying before, that's the advantage that they have. They have all the data, they have the capability to build and they can build quickly. So if you want to talk about agility, that's where it's really coming from. They've got in-house teams and they're digital or let's not say digital, they're technology first, they're financial second. So we as organizations, we need to build those capabilities and stop relying on other people. So that's one of the biggest changes that Hong Leong has made over the last um, four years. We've built up our own um, development centers. And as a result, we can now um, put things out much faster. Now, does cloud have a role to play in that? Yes, definitely. From development and testing, et cetera, yes. But if you're talking about proper runtime and uh, customer security, et cetera, I would also lean towards uh, on-prem for this point in time. Oh, William, how do you build out these capabilities internally while keeping your cost to income ratio lean without uh, relying on external vendors? Well, actually, it's if, if you look at the value chain of it, um, when you're engaging with external parties or, or partnerships to build things, 
there's always a lot of negotiation, there's a lot of paperwork, there's a lot of contractual, there's a lot of procurement, et cetera, involved. If you start to remove these things from the chain, you can move a lot faster. You can experiment a lot quicker. You can um, test things internally uh, within the bank quicker that ordinarily you would need to go and say you would do an engagement with. So the speed to market, the ability to test um, are two of probably the key driving factors in it. And I think that's one of the things, as I say, that the big tech guys really have over us. Because from a financial ecosystem, if they get uh, licenses under financial acts, they cannot sell anything we can't. They cannot provide a service that we can't. They just have the ability to move much faster and change much quicker. That, and that's where I, we believe that um, Hong Leong, anyway, is going to have a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing regulators provide more um, leeway for uh, these new players. Digital banking licenses are being offered in Hong Kong, uh, in Singapore, and in the Philippines. Um, in India, uh, the Bank of Baroda, Akhil, you mentioned earlier that you're looking to digitize your lending operations. What kind of learnings are you uh, extrapolating from that so far and how that may lend itself to other um, uh, missions that you may seek to pursue, that you would like to pursue? See, uh, you know, as, as has been repeated uh, many times in the conversation, you know, it is all being driven by what the customer expectations are. And, uh, you know, COVID actually, uh, the pandemic uh, made sure that 95% of our operations have to almost overnight uh, go digital. And you know, there was a severe lockdown in India. And, um, uh, and that has actually given a big impetus to even that customer expectation journey. Because there is, it is a, of course, a very large country and you know, with a lot of hues and spectrums across customer segments. Now, the, the big middle has also now taken very favorably uh, to the digital journeys. And now, while the payments is fairly digitized in the country, the asset side, the lending business has not been digitized per se. And that is what now, you know, uh, the bank is looking to do. And, uh, you know, and I'm sure you know, there are other banks uh, of very similar sizes in Asia who are also looking to do the same thing for the simple reason that you know, it is the customer expectation. And you know, the customers now expect to, to get an asset, to get a mortgage done, uh, to get an auto loan within 30 minutes, 50 minutes, and in some cases within a few seconds and minutes. So it's, it's a spectrum that we have. And I think there are uh, some very good uh, digital enablers that have also come into the ecosystem to enable that journey. And in absence of those enablers, these things wouldn't have been possible. So you need the enablers, you need the technology platform, and you need the customer demanding that. And now the trifecta is coming together, which is what is actually creating the magic as we speak. And I think give it another two years, the, the market would have fundamentally shifted. Um, and, and decisively shifted over to, I would say, anything around 80 to 90% digital in the lending business as well. Uh, and Noel, uh, earlier you clarified that you had 4.5 million uh, digital customers uh, as of now. What kind of programs are you looking to implement that will provide you some kind of return on investment in, say, the next 12 months? Uh, uh, we, we, sorry, so, uh, uh, that was for me? Uh, Noel, but Akhil, if you have something to say on that, please, uh, but Noel first. Okay. Um, first thing is first, uh, in order to, to grow your customer base, uh, you have to have certain capabilities that's sustainable. And uh, one of these things is the ability for you to, to monetize some of these uh, activities that they're doing. Right. So the programs that we're doing is uh, we're going to create uh, more usage-based um, rewards, more usage-based uh, recognition. Uh, we will be looking at uh, offering product specific uh, based on certain profile. So we're, we're looking at, we're looking like a, a fit for purpose products and therefore clients would be able to, to avail of these products according to their needs, according to their behavior, according to their to their the amount of uh, spending that uh, they're prepared to do uh, when they get on board in the financial services. So this is a part of our roadmap. Uh, we have do a lot, we did a lot of segmentation and uh, we're creating product specific for each of these segments right now. And together with 
with machine learning and AI, uh, we would be able to zoom in and be able to target customers based on this. Anyone care to jump in on this theme? I, I maybe maybe one point from me. I think we talked about commoditization of hardware and commoditization of various activities with with uh, across financial institutions. I think where we can all differentiate potentially is on the client experience side, because that for me is probably the toughest part to to get right. And if you think about it in within private banking, you have you have differentiated segments such as family offices, the high net worth segment, but also in Asia specifically, as we think about um, wealth transfer from one generation to next, what will the next generation of clients look for in terms of client experience? So the proposition for us in Bank of Singapore and client experience, we have to think from a segment perspective, from a demographic perspective, and also from a regional perspective. Clients in greater China are used to a certain level of response when it comes to digital. That may differ within Singapore, it may differ again within the Middle East and again within Europe. So solving that client experience differential across regions and demographics is I think also one of the challenges and opportunities for, for financial services over the next few years. And this will be particularly interesting for players within Asia where we are seeing um, economies grow faster, there is a younger demographic. Uh, so you know, from the, uh, um, the perspectives of uh, folks sitting in Thailand and the Philippines, uh, what are you seeing when it comes to this type of segmentation that you need to address? Well, for for the Philippines, you no, know, what we have seen uh, is really the, you know, the practical the migration of most Filipinos to digital, and in fact, even our regulators came up with a uh, report that during the crisis, uh, during this pandemic, the numbers in terms of transaction count, transaction volume, and value dramatically went down on ATM transactions and also on checks uh, issuances or check uh, transactions. So, and, and yet there has been a double digit growth when it comes to electronic fund transfers. And uh, to the point made by our, you know, our co-panelists here about you know, the proliferation of non-bank payment uh, you know, uh, modalities uh, for use for, you know, for uh, ordering of food, ordering of other of online services, etc. So that whole idea is on how you could embed your uh, payment proposition to all of those, uh, uh, you know, mobile apps available, such as, for example, e-commerce sites and other other mobile apps. In fact, in the Philippines, we have seen almost, I think, we have seen an exponential growth as well, in so far as mobile apps are concerned. So that's why I think it is really essential for any bank player, especially in the Philippines, for example, to really adapt uh, or level up to the requirements of your consumers, especially during this critical period. It, 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 so in Thailand, oh, sorry. Uh, Noel, then William. Yeah, if I may jump to the, the, the traditional metrics of looking at transaction volume growth and so on. But what is more important uh, behind that is the ability for the institution to be able to monetize it because volume, volume creates costs. Right? It, it's not a. It's not about uh, having more volume. The unit cost goes down, right? But the actual quantum of that cost goes up as well. So what needs to be understood is, as you create this volume, as you create more customers, as you create more transactions, where do you get the returns? Right? The returns should be the one funding it for the next generation, right? For you to constantly pour in investment. The technology moves so fast, and the ability for you to keep up with that change in technology, changing demographic, uh, um, customer base, experience, and so on, should be funded right, by certain returns that you've made in the past. So without the clear, clear uh, roadmap of where, where is the return going to come from, digitalization will just hit a snag somewhere. right? So that is what is crucial as we as we journey forward. That's that's my perspective on that. In Thailand, uh, because of the uh, the Bank of Thailand uh, had, had created a nationwide uh, payment system 
for retail called PromPay, and now there's no cost to, to the uh, customer. Uh, and also, as Thailand has one of the highest use of social commerce, now they've be become uh, the fastest growing segment would be the social uh, commerce. Uh, so there are millions and millions of um, people are selling through social commerce and are paying through prompt pay system. And uh, one of the highest volume were, were uh, two days ago at, at, at month, month, month's end. Uh, so these are the new development in Thailand. So the highest volume, but again, that will cost you something. So how do you generate those returns to pay it forward? Uh, William, I uh, believe you had something you wanted to share? Yeah, no, it was more back to, um, uh, I think, uh, Vito's comments. The, with regards to connecting the digital chain, the connecting of the digital chain is going to be very important. Um, it's, you're right, if the banks or the financial institutions aren't careful, we will fall into the background. So if you look at telecommunications industry, for one, the telecommunications industry, they literally have just moved to the back end. When someone's using Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, WeChat, they don't think about the carrier. Yes, it's a fundamental component of the infrastructure. That's, there's no lie. But people don't think of it. So if, if we don't start engaging the customers and we don't get into those value chains, the digital value chains, as you're saying, with the provisioning of the e-commerces, with the provisioning of foods, and we don't remain innovative and relevant, we will literally just fall into the background and become an organization where people come and place money and take loans. So that's one of our key things that we are also looking at is how do we connect into this um, digital value chain that is being created and accelerated, or I say not accelerated, being adopted much faster as a result of COVID. Because you're right, people want to do things from the safety of their home, they don't want to leave. And so they are moving to digital. Um, a lot of people that were probably apprehensive of digital earlier with uh, online mobile financial transactions, et cetera, they're now taking it in. So yeah, yeah I, I, I think William, William, you're making a, you know, you're making a really good point there, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, and I think you made the broad point earlier on, right? Which is you're in, so far the banks are in the transaction business as opposed to really worrying about what the transaction is for, right? So I think uh, so long as you provide just the loan, but what, not what the loan is for, then I think you are right. You're going to lose uh, lose control of the of the uh, customer, and you're you're very likely going to become a commodity provider, right? I mean, the other side of the contrast, though, is and Akhil's talked a lot about, uh, you know, the Agri platform that they've set up in Bank of Baroda. I think if you look at the Yono platform, which is a marketplace that SBI has created in India, you know, they have added 21 million customers on the back of that marketplace, right? their revenues have gone up 40 percent as a result of that particular marketplace and there's a very simple rule that sits at the heart of this right which is for every dollar of revenue that's being generated for the bank out of that platform there's about eight to ten dollars worth of revenue being generated for members of the ecosystem right and if you've got that sort of equation uh, then i think uh, you, you know it's a self-sustaining type of uh, organism if i could put it that way around right Yes, I, I agree with you. And it's it's identifying those partnerships. It comes back to exactly what they were saying about, um, I don't want to use the word monetizing because we're meant to be um, assisting the customers. But yes, we have to work out how we get into those value chains, ecosystems, and how we work together, um, both to stay relevant and both to ensure that there is a commercial offset, obviously. I think, I think the other point I'd also make, right, um, uh, Sophie and Pano, would be, um, it's the way in which data is being used by the big tech companies, which is also extremely important, right? Because you know, if you look at the way in which Alibaba and financial lends money at the moment, right? I mean, it's using the transaction activity on its platform to really assess what somebody's ability to repay is. And they're able to make instantaneous credit decisions for you know, amounts that could be as small as a thousand dollars, right? And it's really pay, you know, very much based on that particular person's ability to repay, which is very different from the traditional way in which a bank would look at things like financial information and security and whatnot before they're prepared to lend money, right? Yes. And yeah, so I think when um, we first started, uh, that's what I was saying. So our, at least at Hong Leong, our focus is going to be very much on that because we do realize um, while we do have a lot of data, 
uh, we and the industry as a whole, you're right, has predominantly been more interested in ensuring that the transaction is facilitated than actually trying to work out what it was for. So we've never got to know our customers properly, which is going to change. We, that's where the majority of our effort will be in the next couple of years. It's just a rejoinder to what William said. Uh, in fact, in the Philippines, I think, I think that this will also apply across all markets. Uh, what is really in, what the key imperatives right now is while we, uh, we, while we all agree that digitalization will be the front set, uh, will be the left, right and center of, uh, of all of these things happening um, currently, I think number one would be on, in the Philippines, for example, on how players will be able to capture the 55 million and top uh, adult Filipinos. Second would be on how you can entice existing customers of other players uh, to be able to switch. And third would also be on how you could protect your existing base and business from poaching, right? So I think those would be the three imperatives uh, for you to really embrace and always be, you know, uh, at the forefront of your of your business mindset, especially nowadays. Especially because in the Philippines, with the with the entry of digital bonds, because the BSP, our regulator, just recently approved and released the regulation on the uh, digital bank licensing framework that will now allow even 100% ownership of uh, digital bank operations in the Philippines. So imagine not only the local players would would now be at risk of potentially, you know, losing their business or be uh, at uh, stiff competition with the other players, but with the entry of other foreign entrants into the space will definitely be a major uh, a heightened competition in 2021. And on the point of heightened competition, uh, the Hong Kong Exchange is facilitating the uh, uh, welcoming, one could say, of a lot of new economy players uh, into the ecosystem here in Hong Kong that have a stronger footprint uh, in, in Asia, therefore, uh, so what are some other pitfalls perhaps that could should be avoided uh, by players within the industry as we get more new economy uh, names coming into play? Well, we, uh, we certainly have very strong uh, policies and regulations uh, that uh, will govern us how and when we can uh, admit uh, those new companies. Uh, into into the uh, into onto our platform. So I think we will we will continue to 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 uh, to do uh, that trend. But but I think um, well earlier on we talk about data, but uh, uh, it's not only just data, but information. Um, I think uh, information is really necessary to help to make sure that the investors into our market are actually investing in a way that they are well you know informed about you know the situation of of each of the of the company now to this to this end i think uh, xaex has done a lot of work in terms of uh, uh publishing and making easier as access of the uh, information about all our uh, listed companies on our on our platform and at the same time i think this is an area where you know new uh, technologies like ai uh, et cetera, can actually help uh, for the participants in analyzing and understanding uh, 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 the public information that we offer uh, about uh, those uh, listed companies uh, on our platform. We ourselves, as a regulator of these companies, actually do employ uh, AI to help us to monitor and also very quickly uh, 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 come up with um, alerts maybe or, or, or areas of investigations that we need to get into, in, into uh, those uh, companies. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for sharing your thoughts today on what could be the future beyond COVID for financial services and the areas that uh, you're participating in. We've had a lot of food for thought today, including how to avoid, avoid commoditization uh, as banks, how to be part of the digital value chain and to be part of the back end of the digital journey that your consumers are embarking on. Thank you once again uh, for all the insights that you provided today. And I wanna, uh, of course, give a thanks to Likit Wargley, who's joined us from IBM to help set the context uh, for this conversation. It's been wonderful to have uh, the, the, uh, everyone jumping in. It's been very insightful. I've learned a lot uh, today. We will send key takeaways um, from this discussion to everyone involved thereafter. So again, thank you so much for taking your time to be with us today. 
for the Future of Finance Roundtable. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.